Good afternoon, and I am April Ryan, White House Correspondent for the American Urban Radio Networks and CNN Political Analyst. And today we're here for a very worthy cause. It's a cause and the topic. Let's talk about it. Children and homelessness. Once again, I am April Ryan, and I am honored to be here for this panel discussion and this conversation. And uh, we're going to start off with a few facts about the Nicholas House on children and unemployment for all of us. Uh, it's something to think about in this next 30 minutes and just something to think about in this historic moment in time. Bullet point one. Low income families are often exposed to chronic stress, including unreliable access to food, health care, and stable housing. Bullet point number two, children growing up in poverty fall behind early. Gaps are evident in key aspects of learning, knowledge, and social emotional development. Bullet point number three, in the state of Georgia, in Georgia, 63% of African-American children live in low-income families, 71% of Hispanic children compared to 32% white and 35% Asian. And also in the state of Georgia, bullet point number four, 53% of children under the age of six live in low-income families and 47% age six or older. Well, this is a conversation that we need to have. And joining in on this conversation today, Director Lamar Smith, Department of Family and Children's Services, and Dennis Bowman, Executive Director of Nicholas House. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for, for being a part of this conversation and having me here. As you know, I'm a parent, and, and I work in a very unique space and place, the White House, and um, where everything comes to uh, the White House from water peace and everything in between. And this is one of those in-between issues, and we don't want it to fall through the cracks, correct? Yeah. So let's start off. Um, Mr. Smith, given uh, the rising unemployment numbers in the state of Georgia due to the COVID pandemic, where are new or existing trends that you are seeing involving poverty and its impact on children? Well, first of all, good afternoon, April. It's great to be here uh, with you and with Mr. Bowman uh, today. I, I want to set a context for you all that any families that were vulnerable before the COVID-19 crisis certainly are still in that predicament. If not, uh, the stakes have been raised uh, for these families. Uh, when you think about families who are uh, on the verge of homelessness, how are they able to maneuver to access services? Um, if you think about multi-generational households, uh, young families or grandparents raising grandkids, the, the context in which a global pandemic impacts families or vulnerable families is most critical. Um, they are trying to find new ways to get these most essential resources that they need uh, around food, um, shelter, um, education. And, and in the context of a virtual world, uh, sometimes the, this, this digital divide that we hear is very real um, and can lead to isolation for some families. So we have families who never before also uh, have not been reliant on economic support services and now find themselves at the door um, of, of the DFACS offices, which we, we call it here in, in Georgia, the Division of Family and Children's Services. And so they find themselves having to rely on SNAP or food stamps, uh, general assistance, which is a uh, utility assistance or assistance with rental um, bills or in fact mortgage. What I'll say we've been able to pivot on very quickly in DeKalb County uh, mm -hmm. is allowing uh, families to, with a greater level of frequency to apply for utility assistance. Mm -hmm. assistance, And in fact, uh, with uh, some support from the DeKalb County CEO, uh, Mr. Michael Thurman, we've been able to provide some mortgage assistance as well. As you can imagine, uh, it is very terrifying for families who have been in homes for five, 10 or 15 years to now be faced with eviction. And so the fact that they can come to our doors and look for this most vital support uh, is, is assuring to know. Um, but at the same time, we want families to know when asking for help, uh, that's not identifying a vulnerability. In fact, it's identifying a, a protective capacity to say that you need shelter uh, for your family and that, that, sh that the um, stigma of assistance shouldn't be one that families are worried about. 
Uh, and, and Mr. Smith, before I go to Mr. Bowman, I just want to, to highlight the point, what's happening in Georgia right now. Georgia is seeing a rise in numbers in, in COVID cases. Um, you know, there is a fight uh, in Georgia between right now the mayor and the governor. This thing is real. And then I know um, you have uh, people like Jamal Bryant at New Birth who has lines, I mean, for, for days. Uh, for people to get food. And they're coming from all around, from other states and other communities, um, it, from other states and in other counties uh, in the state of Georgia. This is a very real pro uh, problem. Am I correct with what I'm, the assessment that I'm getting from the state of Maryland and working at the White House about what's happening in Georgia? Uh, you're, you're correct. Fam families are in need. Um, families are uh, folks who work um, are looking for economic assistance because there is either unemployment or underemployment. Uh, and so, but, but what I think you raised is really good. You have our faith-based organizations stepping up to mm -hmm. meet the needs of our neighbors, of our citizens, of our community. And that's what it should be about. Um, the Division of Family and Children's Services government can't do that work alone. It's not designed that way. And you really get back to this whole uh, village mentality that it really does take a village to support a family. So uh, while the numbers are long, the lines are long, I am optimistic at this community response uh, to families and children in need. So as we talk about families and children in need, we want to highlight the Nicholas House. And Mr. Bowman, before we go to you, because this is your piece. This is your baby, and you're doing phenomenal work. And I mean, I am a parent of two kids. And to hear that you matriculate 100% of the kids that are there, I'm just like in awe. So before we go to you, let's go to the video and talk about the Nicholas House and see what the Nicholas House actually offers. Let's go to this video. Hi, I'm Raina Short with Delta Community Credit Union. I am the manager of our Community Development Department, and we are honored to partner with Nicholas House as a silver sponsor of the 2020 Dream Builders virtual event and the Let's Talk About It forums for homelessness. We are so proud to work collaboratively to help homeless families achieve self-sufficiency. Our vision at Delta Community is to be Metro Atlanta's preferred place to bank, known for providing our members honest value, superior service, and trusted advice. We are so honored to assist vulnerable families served by Nicholas House with valuable financial literacy and educational opportunities to help to create a sound path toward their financial self-sufficiency. We encourage other community leaders to join us in strengthening families, improving lives, and making a difference. You provide such a needed service and that's a great buy-in. I mean, so first of all, how much buy-in do you have from the community because you do such a great job and, and such you, you offer such a tremendous service, a needed service at a time such as this? Well, we have tremendous uh, buy-in from the community. The video you saw was actually one of our, our sponsors for these discussion series and that's why they were there. Uh, talking about how they support us. But at Nicholas House, you know, we, we have an issue of uh, even before it, a tremendous need among homeless families and children. 37% of the homeless population in, in, is actually families. And at Nicholas House, 70% of the people we actually house and serve are children. And every single night, we're housing about 300 homeless children and parents here in the metro Atlanta area through multiple programs that we provide that meet the needs of various, you know, families at various stages of need. We have an emergency shelter to really uh, address the needs of families who are sleeping in the streets, in the cars, even in storage units, and able to get them immediately housed, get stabilized, get a plan together so they can get income and hopefully get into an apartment if possible. For those families who have income but may not be making enough, we have a rapid rehousing program. And in that program, families, we get them into a, an apartment with a lease in their name. They pay 30% of their income, whatever that may be, toward their rent. And then we make up the difference and then work with them to be able to grow their income so they can take over full payment and we can be out of the picture and they're living, you know, moving forward. We have another program that's for people, the permanent supportive housing program for people who are even at more dire straits because they have disabilities and it's gonna take a while to actually 
economic success of that family. But across all of those families, we have the same goals. They're going to be maintaining their, their own housing long term, have a healthy family environment, and, and be able to earn a living wage. But what's really happening right now is because of COVID and the economic impact, we have a homeless prevention program that is just exploding. We are the size of our homeless prevention program because families have lost their jobs. They're getting behind in rent, behind in mortgages, behind in utilities, and we're just trying to help people hold on to what they already have and not become homeless. And that's what we've really been seeing the tremendous expansion right now. Um, and of course, for all of these families and all those programs, uh, we're helping meet the basic needs too. People you know, are in need of food now. So we're helping with vouchers, mm -hmm. groceries. Um, and then certainly in some cases, obviously, it's the rents and the utilities, but also transportation access and um, um, clothing, whatever those needs are, to help get the family stabilized and then set them on a path of the plan to be successful long term. Tremendous, tremendous efforts. Um, it's just it's blowing my mind just listening, um, because this is not going anywhere anytime soon. And, and it sounds like you, you're trying to prevent from what you said. How many people are you seeing on a weekly basis coming to these homeless prevention programs? And also um, a follow-up question, since COVID, how have you kind of gone into the, the retrofitting to physical distance? And because we still, everyone is still de dealing with that, you know, just to make sure that everyone is safe in the midst of trying to help a community in need. Uh, well, we're probably getting 100 calls a week for sure in terms of needing assistance from families, um, new people, and our case managers are trying to move forward with them as quickly as possible. In terms of, as you call it, our uh, protocols for, for the, this COVID environment, and obviously in our shelter facility, there's continuous cleaning every two hours, wiping down common areas. Everyone has to have you know, hand sanitizer and washing hands upon entry. Uh, we have staggered meal times. So not everyone is eating at the same time. So it's about eating in the dining hall, um, things like that. We actually have an after-school program that we may talk about later where you know, all the kids have to have their temperature taken before they actually enter the room. Um, our case managers, we have a lot of families who are in apartments that we're assisting and they're in apartments. So our case managers have actually been having Zoom meetings like these with you know, 20 families at a time, helping them to understand, you know, here's what you can do with your children during this time. Also, you know, this is the um, how to help emotionally get through the isolation that people yes. are during this time. Yes. Just having that opportunity to talk back and forth and yes. also provide resources. What are the community resources and places you can reach out for, you know, the school system who might still be providing meals down the street, those kinds of things. Sounds like you, you provide um, something on every level of life. Uh, in the midst of COVID at Nicholas House, and it's, it's fantastic. And the emotional piece, the isolation piece is real. Um, we've seen so many people go through depression um, and just be upset during this moment because as we physically distant ourselves from people, that's something we don't normally do. You know, we are, uh, what is it, socially connected but physically distant. That's what I say. But, <laughs> but thank you for that. Uh, uh, Mr. Bowman. Now, Mr. Smith, I want to go back to you. Uh, based on the cases that you see, describe the impact of chronic stress, like we talked about that emotional piece, domestic violence that is on the rise, especially before the economies opened up, and the neglect and abuse on the development of children that live in poverty. So what, what you're going to see is, uh, again, any negative attributes that you that you can think about related to stressors, COVID-19 will only exacerbate that, right? So, so these families who were vulnerable before COVID-19, that still persist and is only exacerbated, and particularly black and brown families, mm. for them, they, 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 we, they are struggling. And exposures to prolonged trauma have lifelong impacts, right? We know the research tells us that that people who are exposed to prolonged trauma, domestic violence, um, poverty, um, abuse, that your bodies respond differently. You release cortisol and that, that you then become predisposed to diabetes, hypertension, um, increased morbidity, and decreased life expectancy. And so how does that show up for you? If you are a child, you show up at school unprepared to learn, mm. restless, um, unengaged, not prepared to have um, meaningful or healthy relationships with peers. When you're an adult, how does that show up? 
you are not prepared and focused uh, to find a sustainable living wage. Um, and so all those things then begin to spiral, right, in, in, into a household or a family that is very vulnerable. And to get back to, to Mr. Bowman's standpoint, a family that is very vulnerable and ripe for homelessness. And so, so what do we do about that? And how do we, and how do we help families who exposed to trauma or to stressors uh, perhaps begin to self-soothe or self-medicate that perhaps may lead to substance abuse? Well, having to serve families or ensuring that families aren't isolated is one of those. And you talked about being uh, creatures of and being social and engaging with one, another's, um, with one another. We have to ensure that families who are in trouble aren't isolated mm. and ensure that we engage and find different ways to do that uh, in this time. Uh, and I think we can talk about that later. But another part of the work is, and we forget about other populations, there are young people who are aging out of foster care every day who are not prepared for adulthood. And we know that at a higher rate than uh, their peers, they are couch surfing. Uh, they are unemployed or they are underemployed. And so young people who are 18, 19, 20 and older um, are not working, are homeless, um, who are exiting our foster care system. In addition, you have LGBTQ, LGBTQ youth who also are homeless. And what's most unfortunate is when situations become very dire and very extreme, resort to Things such as survival sex for basic needs as food and shelter. Wow. So in an environment now where you have COVID-19, um, you now also have an increased risk now, right, to a virus where you could also have a compromised immune system and not have access to uh, available health care. So it, it, it's very critical and it's complex. Mm. Mr. Mr. Smith, thank you. And Mr. Bowman, you're just sitting there and, and, and you're listening, and I'm just thinking about all of this on your shoulders. This is a major lift um, in the midst of just in a regular time, but it's a major lift in COVID. I mean, just listening to uh, what Mr. Smith said about, you know, teenagers who age out of foster care, and that, and then you have the LGBTQ community that you know, has issues as well. Every sector has an issue and you are there to help lift them up. What are some of the resources that you have for all of these different communities? Because it's not just, I mean, you think of homeless, you just put everybody in one barrel, but the way Mr. Smith says, he's breaking it down in different uh, communities, different sects, different sectors or what have you. What kind of resources do you have for all of these communities that are in need that come to you? Well, obviously, we're focused on our sector being families, homeless families that include children. In fact, Nicholas House is named after St. Nicholas, the patron saint of children, right? So children has always been a core focus of what we've done. Um, so we have an actual after-school program that we, uh, that we have that focuses on the academic, social, emotional needs of homeless children so that they can you know, progress academically, come up to grade level, and then move forward beyond that. We have a, um, an all-day summer camp when school is not in session during the summer or around the holidays. And that's going on right now, in fact, in the midst of, of all the COVID. We still have the kids coming together, having fun, but also uh, continuing academic progress during the summer because that is how we can move those children and future generations forward is to maintain an emphasis on regardless of where you are, there's a place you can, be, can go in the future. Um, and I, we know that from that, 100% of the children who are with us will graduate to the next grade level. And even in an emergency shelter, they usually average about 30% of the children on the honor roll at school while living in a shelter because of that support that we're providing them in academics and after school programs. And you have 30% of the children in the, on the honor roll? On the honor roll at school while living in a shelter, absolutely. And that's because of the, the emphasis that, 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 that we put on that academic support, identifying where they are academically. Usually everyone comes in uh, behind in math and reading, trying to bring them up to that level. Um, and just the structure itself gives an added stability to the child to help them to respond to those, you know, uh, that, that progress. And, and for the parents, obviously a huge part of supporting the children is to support the family and the parents to become economically stable. So we have those life skill classes, those financial literacy classes, the, 
the Parenting 101, the finance, the budgeting classes. And we actually have an employment navigator who works one-on-one -on -one with the parent to sort of handhold them into finding a job opportunity, placing them into that job. And then that job usually that you might get just to get some cash coming in the door is not gonna sustain your family. So what is the long-term employment pathway that will give you meaningful income growth in the future? And that that means education or skill developments or certifications or whatever it might be, figure out that plan so that the entire family, both the parent and the child, has a plan of action to move them forward to future sustainability. You need to patent this and put it around the nation. I'm telling you, I'm just so impressed. And again, as a parent of two grade school children, one a senior in high school and one going into seventh grade, you know, it sounds like you're beating the national average when you say you have 30% of your kids on the honor roll. That's, 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 that's amazing. And then just the resources, the financial piece, because a lot of people, once they, you know, once they start making money, they don't know how to take care of the money. And that is something that I've always said that we need to work on with everyone. And I love this. I love this program. Again, we need to duplicate it across the nation. Um, both of you guys need to come up here. So, <laughs> but, um, so Mr. Smith, what's Georgia's statewide plan to help reduce barriers for children and their parents, as well as decrease uh, factors that lead to the demise of family stability and structure? And is the plan working and why or why not? So, so as you can imagine, uh, that that's a huge question and that's mm -hmm. an obvious task. But Georgia's plan, uh, I believe, is in response to uh, a federal act that was passed in 2018, the Family First and Prevention Services Act. And so for many years, our child welfare system was set up and funded by, and I won't get too, uh, too much into the weeds, I can be a nerd about this, April, but uh, our system was set up and funded by uh, Title IV E funds. But in order for a state to use those funds, a child had to be in foster care, which essentially means that a child has to be out of the home. It's an out of home placement. So it's almost as if the system was incentivizing breaking up homes so that a child and a family could get services. Well, the feds have said they thought better of that, right? And so with this Family First Prevention Services Act, they've said to states, hey, we want to invest in prevention services. We believe that children and families belong together and they do best together and they do best together in their communities. And so over the next year and a half, uh, Georgia, uh, along with many other states, will be working to implement plans uh, so that we can be compliant with, uh, but also to be our best around envisioning uh, how we can support families in staying together. Um, we, we try at all possible not to remove kids unless it's necessary. But we know that families deserve to be together. Children do best in their homes, in their communities. And when they can't be with their families, they deserve to be with extended family. And when they can't be with extended family, they deserve to be with kin or fictive kin. And so really to, to answer your question, this whole thing about around stability of a system is how are we really investing in families before they get to the point that a removal is necessary. Mm. And know that even when that may be the safest thing, that is still causing additional trauma to families and to children. So it is really about investing in prevention services, uh, working with partners like the Nicholas House, so that you're not just um, identifying or providing an intervention to a specific issue, but you are wrapping services around and strengthening families. And that's what I hear Mr. Bowman saying today, that yes, a family may come to us when they are homeless, but we're not just simply housing families. We are wrapping around services. We are skill building. We, we are helping them find paths to self-sufficiency and hopefully to be thriving families. And that's what's needed. And that's what uh, Georgia is envisioning to do uh, with the support from our federal partners around the Family First and Prevention Services Act. So, you know, um, we always talk about, um, we always talk about problems, but it seems there, there are solutions here. And, and Mr. Bowman, I want to give you the last question before we wrap up. Um, and, and I want to give you this last question. Um, we talk about the issue of generational wealth, but we don't talk about generational poverty. 
And that's something that uh, you guys are working on. So can you talk to me about the issue of generational poverty and its impact on children? And are you seeing this problem in the community? And if so, how is the Nicholas House addressing it? Well, there is absolutely generational poverty. Um, well, everyone in life, when you're born, you're, you're sort of dealt a, a deck of hand, you know, deck of cards, and you get to play the, the cards that, that you have. And if you are born into a particular type of family unit or a, a block or a neighborhood mm -hmm. unit, um, that is disadvantaged, then, then you are starting with a, a poor um, deck of cards to start with in, in terms of how, how to play that. Um, and we know that there are systemic barriers to economic advancement that's gonna make it more difficult for you to, to move forward from where you are. So what Nicholas House is trying to do that when families and children come to us, we try to break those barriers. We try to identify and break those down so that that family unit and that child can move forward with a plan of action. Every single family has the sort of total assessment done to determine what are their strengths and where are they gonna be able to move forward in and have a plan that, that we work with them hand in hand to achieve the goals in that plan. Um, most importantly is to bring people immediately out of a crisis situation as mr smith said trauma is a huge issue and particularly for children who uh, whose brains are still developing mm -hmm. that trauma of being homelessness can truly almost rewire uh what their their thinking process is that will impact them for years down the road so we immediately bring people out of crisis house them quickly stabilize the family unit and then most importantly show a, you know, provide a, a goals for the future and a hope for where people can move toward. You know, we ask all the kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? And mm -hmm. anything you want to be, but the path to get there is you're going to have to work toward it and, it and you might have to work harder than other people, but there is a path to get there. A lot of that is with education and skill development. And yes, I've had to explain to, you know, a child why being a princess, you still have to go to school in the future. <laughs> but you still have manage your kingdom right or the boy who wants yes. to you know, the boy who wants to be a quarterback there's a lot of math and strategic thinking that you have to learn about that's right that's right but you have to uh move forward you have to be able to go through education school can be cool that's going to get you your future and that's what we do with the children to try to break that generational cycle of poverty we've seen it happen we have a woman on our board of directors right now who was with a, a child at nicholas house as a young teenager and she came back, she became a successful businesswoman in her own right, has a wonderful family. She came back saying, I want to help the agency that helped me. And we see that all the time with children who used to live at Nichols House have become adults and have come back to help the community as well. I'm so honored to have been part of this uh, necessary conversation. It's necessary because we are seeing the numbers of the unemployed going up higher and higher. Um, COVID has a grip on this nation and we don't see an end right away. And the Nicholas House is an essential part to fixing or helping to aid people transition into back from the brink back into society. And I thank you both for this. Um, this has been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. I needed it. I need to go back out when I'm reporting and tell the world there is a bright spot you know, down in Georgia, uh, the Nicholas House, and, and, and efforts to prevent poverty and prevent homelessness, be it children and parents or be it just all people. And I thank you for this conversation. So Mr. Smith, thank you. Mr. Bowman, thank you so much. And um, just an awesome conversation. And I wanna say a special thanks to our presenting sponsor, Genuine Parts Company. We also like to thank our other sponsors, PNC Bank, Ivy and Rose's Community Fund, Cox and Delta Community. Thank you so much for bringing in uh, this moment that we get a chance to talk about people. It's about humanity. It's about humanity. And this is a piece of humanity that we need to pay attention to. So back to you guys at the Nicholas House. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I also want to point out that if you stick around for just a moment, we have a few slides, but we also have uh, a special new book that's out by Ms. Ryan, Under Fire, and we're going to be able to provide a, a free copy to one of the people who are watching here today. If you will just uh, hold on through the next few slides and the winner will actually be contacted after this session through your email who receives that book, all right? But thank you all, and please join us at nicholashouse.org if you wanna be part of Nicholas House and help us in our efforts. Thank you, uh, both Ms. Ryan and Mr. Smith. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Bowman.